Well, good morning and welcome. And thank you once again for tuning to Elam's online service. We're just looking forward to spend some time together today, worshiping the Lord, hearing from the Word of God. What an amazing week. Did you enjoy the week? Just a great weather, nice and warm. A little bit cooler yesterday and today. And uh, that probably is kind of a little bit of relief but we're enjoying, just enjoying the weather. I'm sure you're enjoying yourself. Hopefully you're getting out doing some stuff. Well, we're looking forward to a, just a special time together. And as uh, I normally say at the beginning of our time, I talk about what, what we're gonna be doing. And we just, uh, are just, we just appreciate Brooke Nichols. Um, I appreciate her ministry. The last number of weeks, we've been able to play some of her music and enjoy her ministry. This morning, she'll be singing a song entitled yes i will some of you might know it if you don't just listen to it just a great song just talking about the fact that maybe sometimes you may not feel like worshiping the lord but you're going to worship in spite of your feelings because god never changes and i would encourage you this morning as she sings sing along with her worship with her and just uh just open your heart up to the lord Again, we appreciate Kathy and uh, her ministry to the children, and she'll be sharing a special message, message for the children this morning. So children that are tuned in today, listen up, and uh, there's some good things that will be shared. My message this morning is uh, a message entitled Racism, Ethnic Privilege, and the Value of a Human. And uh, it's amazing, it's amazing how the Bible addresses every subject there's not a subject that we can that we deal with in our life and the bible doesn't address and you'll see that how true that is in the midst of what all that's going on today in our world with the whole issue of racism the bible speaks right into it and it speaks truth and life and gives us really good direction and wisdom and so we'll be sharing that message with you today so we look forward to this time thank you again for tuning in let's just pray and uh, let's just ask the Lord right where you are. Uh, you know, maybe there's some distractions around you. You're having breakfast. Let's just say, God, I give you, I give you my life. I give you this time. I want to worship you. Lord, I give you everything that I am. I, I just want you to have your way in my life today and you will not be disappointed. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Again, you're so faithful. You're so good. Lord, as we serve you, we realize how faithful you are as we walk through the good times and the bad times, the challenging times. You never change. Your love never changes. You're always there and you're faithful. And so this morning, minister to our hearts. Lord, we come to you, all of us, uh, with different needs, different burdens, different concerns. We come to the same God who can meet us right where we are. And as we've been talking about the fact that you live within us and you can minister to us right where we are, right at our point of need. So I pray we would sense your presence, we would sense your precious Holy Spirit, and you would do the work of healing and restoring and encouraging. Minister to our hearts today in a special way. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said a good amen. Amen. And so as I mentioned, we're going to enjoy uh, Brooke Nichols at this time, enjoy her ministry. She'll be singing, Yes, I Will. Just shut yourself in with God. Raise your hands towards heaven and magnify the Lord as she sings. Sing along with her. Well, good morning. We're so excited to be with you worshiping together today. I want to read to you out of Psalm 107. It says, Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love for us, it never runs out. So let us thank the Lord for his wondrous works and his steadfast love. Let's lift up our voices and let's praise the Lord together. Sing, I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yeah. 
joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Come on, let's sing that out together. Sing, I count on one. Did you enjoy that song? I, I was listening to that song this week and it just really spoke to me again. God's so faithful, God's so good, how important it is for us to say, yes, I will magnify your name and glorify the Lord. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, it's always good to have Kathy involved in uh, sharing messages here online on Sunday mornings. And so we're gonna get her to share a message to you children so you can listen really closely. Following her message, I will be sharing again a message entitled Racism, Ethnic Privilege, and the Value of a Human. And so you need to listen closely at what the Bible says about that subject. But before I do that, Kathy is sharing a message for the children. Does anyone have a blanket like this at home? This blanket is made of fleece. Most fleece today is made from recycled pot bottles but the fleece used in the Old Testament was made from the wool of sheep. It is not uncommon for people to have fleece in their homes, both now and Old Testament times. Fleece is a very soft and warm fabric. It just so happens that a fleece blanket plays a key role in the story of Gideon in Judges 6. The Israelites lived in Canaan under the control of their enemies, the Midianites, because they had been disobeying God by worshiping the gods of the Amorites. The Israelites decided they wanted a different life from being servants to the Midianites. So they called out to God for help and to get them free from their enemies. God asked a common man named Gideon to be their leader. Actually, Gideon was from the weakest clan in the Israelite families, and he was the least important person in his family. Gideon wanted to be sure he had found favor with God and that he would be doing what God wanted him to do. So Gideon made an, made an offering to God, and after God's angel accepted it, 
God asked Gideon to turn, tear down a false god his father had built to end an Asher pole and to build a new altar and make another offering to God. Gideon was scared of his father and the townspeople, so Gideon took ten of his servants and did what God asked him at, at, during the night. God, Gideon soon asked God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you promised, look, I will place a fleece blanket on the thrashing floor. And if there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that's just what happened. Gideon rose up early the next day. He squeezed the fleece blanket out and he got a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me just make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. Some people say that Gideon didn't have enough faith to follow God, but so many people run out and do whatever they want or make plans to do things without asking God. We need to be more like Gideon and ask God for direction and confirmation that we are doing His will for our lives. God has an individual plan for all of us, just like He did with Gideon. Sometimes when we make plans and they fail, we want to blame God. But maybe he is saying that this isn't what's best for you, or no, this isn't my plan for you. You need to go in this direction. God's direction will be better for you or for those lives that you may be influencing. We need to be sure that we are doing what God wants for us, just like Gideon did. We shouldn't set our tests out for God for the sake of testing him, but we need to prayerfully ask God to guide us. Next time you have a big decision to make, go to God and ask him, is this your will or mine? If it's your will, you need to rethink following through on it. But if it's God's will, then let him lead you through it and see what he can accomplish in your life. Kids, you can apply this to your daily lives. Just like making decisions on who to be close friends with, what activities should take priority in your life, and how you're going to treat your family or friends, and how you're going to react when you're not getting your own way. Always remember, God loves you and wants what is best for you. Bye, and I'll see you next week. When Jesus tells the Good Samaritan story, his story is really about racism, ethnic privilege, and the value of a human. Do I have your attention? We hear a lot about those uh, topics today. We're going to talk a little bit about it. You know, it all starts when Jesus is asked a question by a religious leader, a religious lawyer. Here's how the question goes. The question is, what's, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what do you say? Notice how Jesus answers a question with a question. Jesus had a purpose. What should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what do you think? And the religious lawyer turns to the law of the Bible that he knew, and he quotes it. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you nailed it. But watch this. This is why Jesus asked questions. Because he wants to know the real reason why someone is asking that question. So the lawyer isn't satisfied with what Jesus has said. He wants to know a little bit more because he wants to find out if there are some people out in the world that he doesn't have to love. And so he says in Luke chapter 10, verse 29, the man wanted to justify his actions, it says. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? So he wants, he wants to get off the hook. He's got these Gentile people, and they're Jewish people. And a lot of them begin to feel that they were a bit superior to the Gentiles. And they had this ethnic group in their culture at that time. It's, they're called the Samaritans, that they hated, they despised. They wanted to sort of quote the Bible verses but still be able to justify not loving this group of people. 
So Jesus creates a story and he chooses the characters that will be a part of the story. He chooses two temple personnel. He chooses a priest and a Levite, temple Levite. How did you become a priest? How could you become a priest? How did you become a, a Levite? Very simple. You had to be born into a Levite tribe, born into a priesthood family in order to be serving in that capacity, in order to have that position in that culture. In other words, you had to come from a certain ethnicity to have this privileged position. Jesus chooses them because they have to come from a certain ethnic background in order to serve in that position. Now, Jesus talks about the Samaritan. Some translations refer to them as the despised Samaritans. They were looked upon as being an inferior race. What's the history behind the Samaritans? Let me fill you in with this. Over 400 years before Jesus' time, the Babylonians had invaded, defeated Israel, and carried most of the Jewish people into captivity. People like Daniel and Esther and Nehemiah carried them off into exile. But not all the Jewish people left the nation of Israel. Some were left behind. And as the years went by, those that were left behind intermarried with the Canaanites. Now, if you've ever read the Old Testament, you, you'll know that the Canaanites, the Ammonites, the Moabites were as popular to the Israelites as mosquito bites are to Canadianites. You get it? They were enemies to the Jews. And here you have them intermarrying with all of these ites. And you're involved in a fusion of religions. You're taking some of the Jewish faith and some of the Canaanite faith. And so by the time the Jewish people come back from captivity, back to the nation of Israel, they despise these mixed, this mixed race of people, this ethnic group. That's why Jesus himself called them, as they would refer to them, as despised Samaritans. Then you have the third individual in the story. The third individual is a man. Some translations say, say he was a certain man. Some translation calls him a Jewish man, which makes what happened by way of the actions of the Samaritan all the more astounding. So let's go back to the story. Let's get a bit of a bit more information on that road, on, on that road, and then listen to the story of the Good Samaritan. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho, what was significant about that road? Priests and Levites often lived in Jericho and would commute to Jerusalem. So they were traveling on the road at that time. And on the side of the road, there was a lot of places for thieves to hide, to, to hide in, 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 in behind bushes. They would hide behind bushes and surprise travelers on the road and they would steal from them. That was, that's what was happening at that time. Now knowing that context, let's listen to the actual story that Jesus tells. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, uh, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will, will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And so a man is 
in that ditch along the road. He, he's about to breathe his last breath. And two people that are in a position to help and know the Bible verses about helping don't even help. Can you believe that? That's what's happening here. Now, here's what makes this even more unbelievable for us. Every day in the life of every Orthodox Jew, certainly a Levite or a priest, they would quote what is called the Shema. The Shema. Here's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And watch this. And love your neighbor as yourself. Here they are, quoting this verse about loving their neighbor, and yet they are not practicing loving a neighbor who is almost dead on the side of the road. That's, that's mind-boggling. Now the next part of Jesus' story is even more shocking, but in a positive way. We see in Luke chapter 10, and we read it for you in verse 33 to 34, it talks about this Samaritan that stops and actually helps this man. A Samaritan helping a Jew. Remember, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And here you have a Samaritan who was despised, still responding in love. That's mind-boggling. Jesus then asked the Lord this question. Which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandit? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now, folks, here's where we apply this. What does that look like? To go into our community and actually be a good Samaritan. What does that look like? Jesus is saying the Samaritan is the hero in this story. The Samaritan is the one who does what Jesus wants him to do. So what does that look like? Three things for us today. Jesus is saying, first of all, be that person whose attitudes and actions towards others are not determined by the way they treat you. They're not determined by the way they treat you. How many know if someone hates you and you hate them back, you have twice as much hatred. That's all you have. If someone despises you because of your, your ethnicity and you despise them back, you just double the anger. That's all you have. You don't fight fire with fire. You fight fire with water. You give something different. Scripture says what we should get. It says you should overcome evil with good. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have a bigger problem than what you've actually started out with. Let your attitudes and actions not be determined by how people treat you. It's important. Did you know that the chapter before the Good Samaritan story, Jesus was a victim of racial discrimination? In Luke chapter 9, I won't read it for you. The passage is there for you. He is a victim of racial discrimination actually done by the Samaritan. And if you read that account, you see the disciples say to Jesus, tell Jesus on how he should respond. They say, why don't you call down fire from heaven? And Jesus quiets them down. That's not how he does that. Jesus has been a victim of racial discrimination. In the very next chapter, watch how Jesus responds. He doesn't fight fire with fire. He fights fire with water. He loves. Who becomes the hero in the story in Luke chapter 10? It's a Samaritan. A Samaritan. Jesus refuses to let an incident from someone from a different culture cause him to stereotype or generalize other people from that same culture. I don't know how many stories you hear. You know, this person treated us in, in such an unjust way, and so, so therefore everyone in their culture is exactly the same. No, no. Jesus refuses to let somebody else's racism affect him. 
in the way that he is going to treat other people from that culture. Jesus didn't let, watch this, Jesus didn't let their attitude and actions determine how he was going to treat them. He didn't let them dictate the kind of person that he was going to be. And so that's the first point I would share with you. Number two, Jesus is saying, be that person whose attitude and actions towards others are not determined by their ethnicity. By their ethnicity. What, what ethnicity was the man in the ditch? Some translations say that he was Jewish. Others just say he was just a certain man that was in the ditch. But Jesus' whole point is it doesn't matter what the ethnicity was. Value every person being, every human being, whatever ethnic background they're from, value them. This guy who was in the ditch was valuable because he was just valuable. He was valuable regardless of his ethnicity. He needed to be able to breathe, have life, and have a future. He was valuable. Here is our position on ethnicity here at Elam Church. Here it is, very clearly. Every person we meet, regardless of their ethnicity, we're going to value them as someone made in the image of God. We're going to see value in them. Jesus created them, and we're going to bring the best out of them. We're going to love them, empower them with all that we have. Whatever ditch they're in, whatever their background, I'm going to help them become the best person that they possibly can be. So here it is, first two points. We're applying what Jesus is saying, go and do likewise. So be that person whose attitudes and actions towards others are, first of all, are not determined the way, by the way they treat you. You don't treat them the way they treat you. And secondly, is not determined by their ethnicity. But here's the third point as we walk into it. But are determined, our attitudes and actions are determined by Jesus' attitudes and actions towards you. What do I mean by that? Jesus said it himself. He said, love as I have loved you. That's what a Christian is. That's what a Christian does. Do you know who else was in the ditch and needed to be rescued? Do you know who was? You know who was in the ditch? Me. I was going to a lost eternity because I had done wrong in my life. I mean, the wages of sin is what? Is death. And I have a Savior who left heaven to come into the ditch of my sin. And he, and he rescued me and he healed me and he got me going into a future where someday I'll be in heaven where perfect justice is done there forever. That's my story and that's your story too. If you've, if you've said yes to Jesus and have become a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus, it cost him a whole lot more than a hotel and some oil and disinfectant to restore you. He, 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 he came, Jesus gave his life for you on the cross. That's how much he loves us. That's how valuable every human being is to Jesus. A follower of Jesus the way that Jesus wants them to be identified more than any other is the love that they have for one another. Love as I have loved you. That means the way that you'll know Christians who love Jesus with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength is they are the people that are first into the ditch. They're the ones that get in the ditches. Whenever they find a neighbor in need and they, and they get that person help, whatever they may need, they're the person that responds. Folks, what a thrilling way to spend our lives as Christians, helping others come to get to know this Jesus, walking with them and supporting them. Oh, folks, there is a power that is stronger than racism and prejudice 
and discrimination, how many know it's the power of love? It's the power of loving people and caring for people and being there for people when they truly need us. God doesn't want to take sides. God wants to take over, and he wants us to respond in love. A true story I share with you in closing today. A true story that took place before the Berlin Wall was built. There was already a barrier after World War II between socialist countries like Russia and East Germany. And then there's West Germany and democracy. And so there's this tension, this barrier, this despising of one another that would take place there. And as the story goes, a true story, one night under the cover of darkness, some residents in East Germany took their garbage, a truckload of garbage. They took it, they took it over there. there. There was no Berlin wall there at that time. They took it over into West Germany and just dumped it in the middle of the road. So how are you going to respond to that? You insult me, how are they going to respond to them? You dump your garbage, we'll dump our garbage, we'll get even. You know what they did? The people in West Germany, some residents in West, some residents in West Germany loaded up a truck and under the cover of darkness drove it over to the East Berlin side and they unloaded it into a neat pile. What did they load, unload? It was a neat pile of groceries. All kinds of groceries that they left on the east side. And up over the top of it, they left a big sign that says, here's what it said. It said, each gives what they have. Each gives what they have. You know, folks, there are times when I've been hurt or faced some kind of injustice and I go to get back or I generalize or I stereotype and I just have to say Benny stop hold on hold on Jesus you have been so good to me the grace and the goodness you have given to me with all my faults and all my failures how me to love others as you love me Help me to sacrifice to bring out the best in other people's lives. Each gives what they have. Folks, let's give. Jesus has entrusted us, has loved us. Let's give out of the love that he has entrusted to us. Jesus has loved us. Jesus has forgiven us. Each gives what they have. May that be the result. I respond in love. When I see a need, regardless of what kind of person, no matter their background, their ethnicity, no matter what they've done in the past or how they have hurt me, I respond in love because each gives what they have. Let's respond in love. They'll know we're Christians by our love. And so, Lord, we, we, we need help with this one. We haven't, um, as Christians, always modeled the love that we should model. But, but I pray that we would learn today, Lord, again, uh, from your example, how you loved us. We were lost. Sinners, we were in a ditch, and you reached out to us. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You loved us. And so, Lord, may we just respond with that same kind of love. Out of the love you've given to us, may we respond to others as we see need, regardless of who is in need. Regardless of how big or how small the need is, we respond in love. May people know that we love them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
So how important it is for us to be that community that loves one another. May we be known in Elam as, as people that love one another and love, love each other and love anyone and are people that are willing to respond to other people. That's so important that we follow that. A few announcements I want to share with you. Uh, some of these first announcements, if you've tuned in regularly for the last few months, there, you, you'll know what I'm saying. If this is your first time or first few times, just want to remind you of, of giving to Elam. If you'd like to give to Elam, you can give. Some people have envelopes. You can drop your envelopes off at the church with your checks. Uh, someone will pick them up. We, we, make, we have people available to do that. Many people are giving online via e-transfer. And for information on giving online, just go to our website, Elam Church Online, and you'll see all the information on our homepage about giving. Thank you again for being so faithful in your giving through this, well, number of months that we've been online. Just reminding you that you can let others know that if they're not able to tune into our service live via Facebook, that we do post our service on our website, Elam Church Online. You go to Sunday services and you'll find it posted. Of course, this is July the 12th today and with the title and they can go and view it throughout the week. And I noticed that a number of people are viewing uh, via our, our website throughout the week. And so that's, that's wonderful. I want to talk a little bit about, so we've been talking about renovating our, our sanctuary. Remember, we still have a building here. <laughs> Many of you haven't seen it for a while. And we have been discussing the thought of, of renovating our sanctuary. I just want to give you kind of an update of where we're at. The board has appointed Darlene and Ted as, our, as co-chairs. And so they met together and did some, talked a little bit about it. They discovered, Ted and, Ted and Darlene, uh, they established a core committee. And the core committee uh, is made up, of course, Ted and Darlene, Marilyn, uh, Tim, Brad, uh, Brenda, and of course, myself. And we had our first meeting uh, a week ago, and I just, it was great just to sit down with a core committee and just talk about the sanctuary. And we went into the sanctuary. Lots of ideas were discussed. Lots of things were walked through, obviously. From this point, as we begin to think about things that we need to do, research needs to be done. One of the first areas that we need to address is the acoustic design of the sanctuary. And we have hired a consultant that's going to do some work and establish that for us. And so where are we going? The, the core committee is going to meet a few, few more times. Discussions, a little bit of research, hiring consultants and so on. Here's our plan. We want to establish a, large, a larger committee eventually. Eventually, we're going to approach some of you and we're going to create subcommittees that can do further research so we have more people involved and more people that can kind of do some of the legwork in, in answering some questions that we have as we identify areas that we want to address. Here's the goal. Here's the goal of this. We, our goal is, by the end of the year, we would like to present a concept or a vision to the church of, of what this renovation will look like with a budget. It's going to take some time but, and some work, but we want to be able to present something to you, hopefully before the end of the year. And so here's how this renovation project is going to work. The renovation project will be eventually, once we have a vision, the congregation knows about it. We get into the new year. Uh, the renovation project will be broken into stages. Uh, when we raise the money for each stage, so we start with the first stage. We, we feel certain areas are a priority in the program, in the plan, the renovation plan. We set a goal. We say, okay, we want to raise so much money. And if we, when we raise that money, we will begin that first stage. And that's the way the stages would go. Well, the renovation project possibly could take one or two years, probably two years. That's fine. Our goal is to renovate the sanctuary, uh, do the research, renovate it and, and do it debt free. So, you know, a few years down the road, 
we have a wonderful new sanctuary all paid off. And so that's the direction. In the, as we began this process, we did involve you as a congregation. We got you to submit some ideas. As we're working away on this, if you have some suggestions, even at this point, please contact Ted or Darlene and uh, just share your ideas. We'll definitely listen to you as a congregation because this is your church, this is your, this is your sanctuary, and we want you to be involved in that process. And so I just want to make you aware of that. Please be praying for our core committee. And as we establish other committees, please be praying that God will direct us in this matter. I announced last week that the board set the date of August the 9th for the reopening of, of the building here at Elam. Uh, we sent an email out this past week and uh, just letting you know, we're asking you to respond back to us either by phone call or email. Let us know if you are returning uh, for August the 9th. We obviously will be following all the rules set down by Algoma Health. And so we want to be ready. We want to have an idea of how many are coming so that we can prepare for you. And so looking forward to that. Of course, when we meet back in the sanctuary, we are getting everything in place. We have everything prepared so that we can stay online for those of you that aren't, aren't able to attend. So we do want to minister to everyone, regardless of whether it's the builder at the building or, uh, or at home. Okay. And so we're going to pray. And we're just going to, we're going to close it in just a minute, but we're just going to ask the Lord to, to be with us today, throughout the day and throughout this week. I have some prayer requests from Kelly Rowlandson. We're going to pray for her daughter-in-law, Sarah, and for her grandson, Caden. So let's just, let's just pray together and pray for you. And so Lord, thank you again for this time we've had together, the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you for the challenge from your word again. The challenge, Lord, to love, even, Lord, to respond to people with love, even when they're unkind to us, how we need to love other people. We need to reach out. We need to be there for people that are in need. That's what you would do. We would want to follow your example. Lord, we think of the request from Kelly today. We think of her daughter-in-law, Sarah, her grandson, Caden. Lord, you know the needs. You know, Lord, you can come, you can touch them, you can heal them, you can restore them. We just entrust them to you today. We thank you, Lord, that you're able to minister to them right where they're at. And others that are listening today, Lord, we've been praying for Marilyn's son-in-law, Marcello, and their family. Continue to minister a healing touch in his body, in that family. And others, Lord, that are listening, we are praying for Gladys' son, Mark. We thank you for being with him. Continue to keep your hand upon or minister to him, we pray. Throughout this time, Lord, we just commit our lives to you. We commit our time, Lord, to you. Thank you for your presence with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, before I close this morning, I do want to say something that may sound a little, it's not spiritual, so just, I just want to make a comment before we go off, off live Facebook. I had someone comment to me this week about uh, whether I was still a Packers fan, and I want you to know that I still am, and, uh, and someone else had said to me that they wondered if I still should be promoting Pat the Packers, whether that was, that was wise. And uh, those of you that were involved with, with hiring and getting Crime Stoppers involved a few years ago and putting me in prison downtown, I want you to know that I still feel, feel pretty safe here and I'm still, a, I'm still a Packers fan and it will continue to be, hopefully, that there'll be a game in the fall. So just responding to that, those people that were wondering about my picture there and uh, kind of looking around at things while I'm online noticing probably my pictures and stuff but anyways you uh you know what it's been just a great time we've had a great uh day and a great few months we're looking forward to meet in in well you know less than a month looking forward to what the lord has in store for us as a church and ministry this is a whole new ministry that's developed in this time so we thank the lord for this thank you for tuning in thank you for your time i hope that you enjoy your day Enjoy your week, and I say God bless you, and see you next week. God bless.